After this, I went to one man after another, being not unconscious of the enmity which I provoked, and I lamented and feared this. But the necessity was laid upon me. The word of God, I thought, ought to be considered first. And I said to myself, Go, I must to all who appear to know, and find out the meaning of the oracle. And I swear to you, Athenians, by the dog I swear, for I must tell you the truth. The result of my mission was just this. I found that the men most in repute were all but the most foolish, and that some inferior men were really wiser and better. I will tell you the tale of my wanderings and of the Herculean labors, as I may call them, which I endured only to find at last, the oracle, irrefutable. When I left the politicians, I went to the poets, tragic, dithyrambic, and all sorts, and there, I say to myself, you will be detected. Now you will find out that you are more ignorant than they are. Accordingly, I took them some of the most elaborate passages in their own writing, and asked, what was the meaning of them? Thinking that they would teach me something. <laughs> will you believe me? I am almost ashamed to speak of this. But still, I must say that there is hardly a person present who would not have talked better about their poetry than they did themselves. That showed me in an instant that not by wisdom do poets write poetry but by a sort of genius and inspiration. There are like diviners or soothsayers who also say many fine things, but do not understand the meaning of them. And the poets appeared to me to be much the same case. I further observed that upon the strength of their poetry, they believed themselves to be the wisest of men in other things, in which they were not wise. So I departed, conceiving myself to be superior to them, for the same reason that I was superior to the politicians. At last I went to the artisans, for I was conscious that I knew nothing at all, as I may say, and I was sure that they knew many fine things. And in this I was not mistaken, for they did know many things of which I was ignorant, and in this they certainly were wiser than I was. But I observed that even the good artisans fell into the same error as the poets. Because they were good workmen, they thought that they also knew all sorts of high matters, and this defect in them overshadowed their wisdom. Therefore I asked myself on behalf of the oracle whether I would like to be as I was, neither having their knowledge nor their ignorance, or like them in both. And I made answer to myself and the oracle that I was better off as I was. This investigation has led to my having many enemies of the worst and most dangerous kind, and has given occasion also to many calumnies. And I am called wise, for my hearers always imagine that I possess the wisdom which I find wanting in others. But the truth is, O men of Athens, that God is only wise, and in this oracle he means to say that the wisdom of men is little or nothing. He is not speaking of Socrates, he is only using my name as an illustration. As if he said, he, O men, is the wisest who, like Socrates, knows that his wisdom is in truth worth nothing. And so I go my way, obedient to the God, and make inquisition into the wisdom of anyone, whether citizen or stranger, who appears to be wise. And if he is not wise, then in vindication of the oracle I show him that he is not wise, and this occupation quite absorbs me. And I have no time to give either to any public matter of interest, or to any concern of my own, but I am in utter poverty by reason of my devotion to the God. There is another thing. Young men of the richer classes, who have not much to do, come about me of their own accord. They like to hear the pretenders examined, and they often imitate me, and examine others themselves. There are plenty of persons, as they soon enough discover, who think that they know something, but really know little or nothing. And then those who are examined by them, instead of being angry with themselves, are angry with me. This confounded Socrates, they say, this villainous misleader of youth. And then if someone asks them why, what evil does he practice or teach, they do not know and cannot tell. But in order that they may not appear to be at a loss, they repeat the ready-made charges which are used against all philosophers, about teaching things up in the clouds and under the earth, and having no gods, and making the worse appear the better cause. For they do not like to confess that their pretense of knowledge has been detected. Which is the truth? And as they are numerous and ambitious and energetic, and all are in battle array, and have persuasive tongues, they have filled your ears with their loud and inveterate calumnies. And this is the reason why my three accusers, Melitus, and Antus, and Lycon, have set upon me. Melitus, who has a quarrel with me on behalf of the poets. Antus, who has 
on behalf of the craftsmen, Lycon on behalf of the rhetoricians, and as I said at the beginning, I cannot expect to get rid of this mass of calumny all in a moment. And this, O men of Athens, is the truth and the whole truth. I have concealed nothing. I have dissembled nothing. And yet I know this plainness of speech makes them hate me. And what is their hatred but proof that I am speaking the truth? This is the occasion and reason of their slander of me, as you will find out either in this or in any future inquiry. I have said enough in my defense against the first class of my accusers. I turn to the second class, who are headed by Miletus, that good and patriotic man as he calls himself. And now I will try to defend myself against them. These new accusers must also have their affidavit read. What do they say? Something of this sort, that Socrates is a doer of evil and a corrupter of the youth, and he does not believe in the gods of the state, and has other new divinities of his own. That is the sort of charge. And now let us examine the particular counts. He says that I am a doer of evil, who corrupt the youth, but I say, O men of Athens, that Miletus is a doer of evil, and the evil is that he makes a joke of a serious matter, and is too ready at bringing other men to trial from a pretended zeal, an interest about matters in which he really never had the smallest interest, and the truth of this I will endeavor to prove. Come hither, Miletus, and let me ask a question of you. You think a great deal about the improvement of youth? Yes, I do. Tell the judges, then, who is their improver. For you must know, as you have taken the pains to discover their corrupter, and are citing and accusing me before them. Speak, then, and tell the judges who their improver is. Observe, Miletus, that you are silent, and have nothing to say. But is not this rather disgraceful, and very considerable proof of what I was saying, that you have no interest in the matter? Speak up, friend, and tell us who their improver is, the laws. But that, my good sir, is not my meaning. I want to know who the person is, who, in the first place, knows the laws, the judges, Socrates, who are present in court. What do you mean to say, Miletus, that they are able to instruct and improve youth? Certainly they are. What? All of them. Or some only and not others. All of them. By the goddess here, that is good news. There are plenty of improvers, then. And what do you say of the audience? Do they improve them? Yes, they do. And the senators? Yes, the senators improve them. But perhaps the ecclesiastes corrupt them? Or did they, too, improve them? They improve them. Then every Athenian improves and elevates them, all with the exception of myself, and I alone am their corrupter. Is that what you affirm? That is what I stoutly affirm. That is what I stoutly affirm. I am very unfortunate if that is true. But suppose I ask you a question. Would you say that this also holds true in the case of horses? Does one man do them harm, and all the world good? It is not the exact opposite of this true. One man is able to do them good, or at least not many. The trainer of horses, that is to say, does them good. The others who have to do with them rather injure them? Is not that true, Melitus, of horses, or of any other animals? Yes, certainly. Whether you and Anatus say yes or no, that is no matter. Happy indeed would be the condition of youth if they had one corrupter only. In all the rest of the world were their improvers, and you, Melitus, have sufficiently shown that you never had a thought about the young. Your carelessness is seen in your not caring about matters spoken of in this very indictment. And now, Melitus, I must ask you another question. Which is better, to live among bad citizens or among good ones? Answer, my friend, I say, for that is a question which may be easily answered. Do not the good do their neighbors good, and the bad do them evil? Certainly. And is there anyone who would rather be injured than benefited by those who live with him? Answer, my good friend. The law requires you to answer. Does anyone like to be injured? <laughs>